Restoration and Wit reports on board a fast boat to China, bound for Wicker's World. QE2's arrival anywhere is always an event. And today, even nature reacts, choosing this morning to break Australia's worst drought of the century. As she reaches Sydney on her three-month Pacific cruise, the QE2 is greeted by the downpour for which the nation's waited months. Most of the 1,400 passengers and 1,000 crew have also been anticipating this great harbour into which, despite the weather, they are not unescorted. Some valiant palms turn out to show their sodden flags and sound their sirens. Through the murk appears the symbol of Sydney, its coat hanger bridge, alongside the white cows of the Opera House. Yes, this is Sydney, all right, but where is the Australian summer? Even on such a morning, in such a place, normal shipboard activities continue. As at Auckland, the QE2 ties up downtown amid the high-rises. Dockings observed anxiously by the master of the QE2, Captain Arnold. The Australian pilots brew Sydney's endless suburbs, a sort of magical mystery tour, and as we cross the harbour bridge, bewilderment is growing. First a lot of coaches, then a lot of queuing. On our fun evening, who's pushing the boat back? And come to that, who have we travelled all this way in all our finery to meet? What ultimate dignitary awaits at the summit? Is it royalty? The Prime Minister? The President? Well, yes, since you ask, it is the President, but actually, from his White House on Fifth Avenue, New York, it's the President of CUNA. Nice to see you. Do you remember Dorothy, my wife? Yes, I do. He's a former Madison Avenue marketing man with one of those silver tongues. You look just beautiful. Dorothy Bonner, my wife. I, I looked at her and I looked at her. Oh, that was very sweet. Nice to see you. How are you doing? What a beautiful dress you have this evening. Cunard, a quintessentially English institution and ambassador for the British way of life since 1840, still means the Clyde and Southampton to most people. Yet, despite the QE2's British captain, officers and crew, the line's now controlled from the United States by President Ralph M. Uh, I'm with, I'm with your father last time. <laughs> Miriam Nissolo. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Little guessing the happy surprise that awaits, cruisers queue patiently to be nicely seen. Nice to see you. And a floral tribute from him and her. So you've invited all these people, you've dragged them ashore off the QE2 to thank them for doing a lot of cruising. 
Well, that's uh, a reasonably fair statement of what we're doing, yes. Uh, Alan, we've invited uh, people from 28 countries tonight who have made a practice of seeing the world on the world's greatest ship. And to pay tribute to them, we have an Australian evening planned for them here. Now, you're doing this every year? Every year, yes. In some uh, exotic spots? We started in the Ritz, no less, in London, and we had a grand affair with 175 people. Last year, we took over the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore and had 300 people, and tonight we have 400 people here in Australia. Now, what this is doing is just to encourage them to book next year. Oh, I, I wouldn't think that's uh, our main purpose. Our main purpose is to create a little extra excitement for them as a part of their journey around the world and make them feel special, because they are. They've kept the QE2 on world cruising. Now, what about the future of the QE2? You see, I mean, she's now controlled from New York by you. Uh, she is the ultimate British ship. Are you giving the ultimate British ship a, an American accent? I think we're giving a very British ship international flair. I think that's probably a fair way of putting it. Because certainly the majority of your cruisers are Americans. There's no question about that. Yeah, but that's not unusual. The old queens were heavily patronized by Americans, yes. and they were very British. But don't they come on this ship because it's British, not because it's American? As oh, it were. no, no. They come on this ship because of a lot of reasons, not the least of which is Americans love the Brits. Ah, yes, yes. Now, is there a danger? You, you'll tell me if I'm being fair about this. Is there a danger that you're changing a marvelous international restaurant into a very competent American steakhouse? Oh, I... <laughs> that's, a, that's a little overpowering. I, which restaurant are you referring to? Well, the, the QE2. Oh, we're, we're, we are taking a great ship and trying to maintain her traditions, but reaching into the future, Alan, so that she doesn't become outdated. We have to keep up with the time. Submitting to that international flair, the seafarers have tucked into their tomato sherbet, drunk their Australian champagne, at tables that for once remained absolutely steady. He was very, very posh. I say, look here. Where's that Joey Jumba that you've got in your tucker bag? You come a waltzing to jail now with me. Everybody, waltzing the tune, waltzing the tune. You come a waltzing the tune with me. Upon her Pacific Odyssey, the QE2 sails north towards Brisbane. On this ship today, there are some 1,200 passengers who are paying anything from 200 pounds to 800 pounds per cabin per day. And as you can see, there are plenty of cabins and there are six of these decks. This is the door between upstairs, downstairs in mid-Pacific. For these are the fortunate few and on this side of the door, more than a thousand crew whose job it is to make it worthwhile for them to spend that kind of money. But upstairs and downstairs, they need piles of dough. The Kui2 has four kitchens which never close and the 4,000 meals they prepare each day are contradictions in cooking mass catering for a caviar clientele. QE2 recipes usually start, take 2,000 eggs, add half a ton of potatoes, and so on. Today it's a little light lunch for 1,200 and along with every kind of omelette. It looks as though the next recipe in the QE2 cookbook starts, first catch your missionary. But you can't cook for 1,200 in a saucepan and critical cruisers may not be satisfied by a minestrone, however well paddled. People do come on the QE2 
and have publicly said that they come on to test the skills of the chef or of the people on board. Executive I chef John Bainbridge. The people have given us very old recipes from very old French master books to see whether we knew how to do them. And they've openly said, well, we'll test them. But, you know, they, people, I don't think, walk into the Ritz in London and say, well, let's test them. But they, on the ship, it seems to be the thing, you know. Because you do ask for it, don't you, by saying you can have whatever you, anything you want in the world. Well, we, we, have, a, we have to market the ship. I think the food has been, I'll say, interesting. It's improved greatly since we have a new table and the people at our table are, a lot of them are gourmets. We have a wine expert and we take great delight in coming up with a challenge. Uh, every day we vote on our menu, we vote on our dessert, we vote on the wines and so we're, all of us expanding <laughs> our clothes are going to have to get elastic shortly. Now your husband told me that he wasn't eating lunch. He's, well he said that and that was true that day because he couldn't get his trousers on. That's true, too. <laughs> We're both having a little difficulty in that area. <laughs> That's very personal. That's true. The only thing you really have that, any, that you can be sure of is the rack of lamb. If you order it rare, yes. then it comes in sort of pink the way a uh, person would like to have it. Yes. But generally, it's pretty awful food. That's strange. Now, awful. why is that? I think one thing is they don't defrost some of the things properly. Yes. And they said that then if they're not defrosted, then they're not cooked through. There are some people, the natural complainers, that complain all the time. We know we always win by agreeing with them. You do, you win. We've got enough time to do it. If a passenger starts complaining to you and gets you ruffled and all the rest of it, they will carry on doing that. But all the time they do it and don't get you ruffled, eventually they'll stop. They just get and, and, and this I can say by experience. Yeah. You mentioned one just now. And she's called me all the names of the son, not to my face, you know. I never had a mother and father, or never had a mother and father, but still. She's had seven tables. Seven now. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> going all the way to Los Angeles. <laughs> the people next to her wouldn't talk to her because quite frankly, her language was something to be desired. But we can't do anything about that. <laughs> no. So how do you set about handling them? I mean, your people come in. You're, you're pretty severe with them. I've seen you operating, actually. You don't stand any nonsense. I detect that. You get a, you've got a reign of terror going quickly. So. No, no, it's not reign of terror. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't. Uh... No, no, well, no. I, 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 yes, <laughs> I suppose um, you, you, well, you have to control it. This, this you must do. And, and, and truthfully, I suppose one of the hardest days that we have at sea is sailing day. You know? And sometimes we get a sailing day and a docking day together. It's no good. And that is when you are giving the people their seats. Because this is a sort of stage, isn't it, really? And you, you, you set the scene. And you're the performers, really. Oh, yeah. This is part of their day. This is what the people are there for, and everybody's watching you. And so you, you have to give your all. It's no good just, you know, coming to work and think, no, I don't feel like it. It's you, you can't do it. It's Oh, it's mm. unfortunate. Yeah. Yes, yes. Here we are. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, yes. Thank you. But there again, I like the English dishes. You know, such as sausage and mash, and bubble and squeak, milk puddings, and uh, meat puddings, uh, shepherd's pie. I like, I'm very partial, a bit of lobster. I like a bit of lobster, and uh, I, like, uh, I like a lot of fish. I, I do eat a lot of fish. If you want a meat pudding or a meat pie, if you ask for it, you'll get it. If we want uh, a shepherd's pie, same as Joe last night, had lovely shepherd's pie. It smelled yeah. lovely, didn't it? Yeah. And uh, so we can have that tonight. So uh, <laughs> now, on a on a caviar and champagne cruise like this, what uh -huh. when you order a drink, what do you order? Always, I'm a beer drinker. I like a lager. My wife likes a Guinness. People are having today steaks with lobster tails on the top. Yeah. Surf and turf, they call them. Steaks with uh, crab meat on. Crab meat with caviar on. Honeydew melon with caviar on, and... I mean, uh, that's, one, that's ostentatious consumption. Yeah, I would think that's so, stupid, really. really. Really, there's no rhyme or reason to it, other no. than the fact that someone fancies it, shall we say. That somebody wants to spend, they want to spend as much as they can of, of Cunard's money. They want to get their, they want to get their money. Well, oh, it could be said that way. I suppose we are, we're not cheap. I think that there's... Uh, very generous helpings, and you can have 
too much really but I think the flavors are lost in the big batch cooking and this can happen can't it if you're cooking for 1200 people that's and they're they're sparing on salt because people are salt conscious now and so you don't uh, the things are not salted uh, which for me it doesn't have the flavor you know yes. now how many times have you been on the QET? well I've been on the, the I've, I've jumped on board the ship eight times Eight? Eight different times, yes. So the flavor's, the the flavor's not too bad, at any rate. I don't come for the food. Ah. I come for the lovely life you can have. It is a lovely life. A lovely life that's lived in tears. Upstairs on the passenger's number one deck, where they've all paid to sunbathe, chess. Downstairs on the crew deck, where they're being paid, backgammon. Together they staff a floating hotel which has 20 penthouses with balconies, each with a splendid sea view. There are also 46 suites and 860 bedrooms. And as a rule, the closer you get to the waterline, the less experience the attention, the more modest the cabin. Hi, Jim. How long are you going to be, darling? Sailing before the mast has acquired a different flavour these days. Captain Bly would be staggered by the relationship between passengers and crew. We had a little old man, 92, last world cruise. And the ship was a bit rocky, you know, and he was very shaky himself, you know, he couldn't get into the shower. And he, he was very distressed because he hadn't had a shower for three days, so he asked me, would I give him a shower? <laughs> so I asked the steward, and the steward said, well, I'm not giving it to him, you know. So I, I felt sorry for him, so I went in when he was undressed, stood him in the shower, turned the shower on, kept my eyes, you know, shoulder level, you know and <laughs> shook the shell over his head. So this is all right for a couple of days, but after a while he got cheeky, you see, and he used to say, you're not drying down there. <laughs> but that was the end of his shell, it's never got no more. He was a very famous singer on board, very famous. I can't say his name. And the stewardess brought his breakfast in, and he's standing in his dressing gown and went, <laughs> quick flash. flash yeah, yeah. So she put the tray down, ran out, told the steward, the steward went in and he was in the shower. He said, everything is all right now. So she went back in for the tray and he said, I'm very sorry about that, Angela. Oh, no. Doesn't matter. He said, I'm very sorry about that. He said, that shouldn't have happened. He said, but what do you think of that? <laughs> you do get passengers who say, um, I'm talking about couples now. Come and have a drink. And they feel most offended. Um, you're, you're trying to do your work in the evening, right? right? They may have friends in. Oh, this is my steward, Alan. And they're, they're really over the moon to introduce you to their friends. This is, oh, he's terrific, or whatever, you know, whoever the steward right. is. Have a drink. And, all right, in the old days, you dare not do it. Wrong because you'd, you'd be in trouble for it. But now, I don't say you're allowed to do it, but you still do it for that reason. I've got a passenger that won't be called Mrs. Phillips, which is her main, uh, surname. She wants to be called Virginia. She won't, you know, she won't have it. And I, 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 to start with, I did call her Mrs. Phillips, but she wouldn't have it. She insisted I called her Virginia. And, you know, she's a very nice lady. I've got another one, Miss Ka Mrs. Catherine Lovering. She's a very old lady. Um, I go in in the morning, mornings, and she, she must, I must call her Catherine. You know, it's funny. I don't know why, but there are a lot, you know, these are all old ladies. I mean, none of them are young people, and yet, you're, you feel more like their grandson. You feel like you want to call them yeah. grandmother or <laughs> missus. Yeah. You don't yeah. feel like you want to call, call them by their first names, but you do. Passengers who can afford the time and the money for such a three-month cruise are, of course, usually elderly, often American, mainly women. And some of these dauntless grandmothers want to dance all night. Others struggle gamely from party to party. But some are more traditional and tranquil. All are comforted by the knowledge that this British ship has two doctors, one a surgeon, plus a dentist and four nurses in a hospital which can handle almost any emergency. And they take your injection and they, uh, they give it to me. 
I just come down to the two and a half hour clinic upstairs where I saw about 15 people, all of them really very unwell at varying degrees. Um, but because they're very old, a lot of them, they come on terribly ill, some of them, with, with rodges of notes um, from their doctors and, and suitcases of drugs. And, and, and because they, they know that the setup here is quite good, we have two doctors and four nurses. And, uh, this little hospital, which is very well equipped, and everybody from every other ship has been here, has been most impressed by the, the setup that we have. This, I suppose, this has to be the best place in the world to have a heart attack. Yes, I think I, I choose to have mine here probably. Yes. Because the team, as we're such a, we are in a ship. Uh, we can be, we reckon, to be there with what's called a starlight call, which is this tannoid call, the word starlight. An emergency call? Mm, yes, yes. So within about four minutes, the whole team reckons to be there, four or five right. minutes, day or night. So that's very good. Are there some people who, for example, would come on a cruise like this as having saved up to, to say goodbye to the world, really? To, to... I'm sure that does happen. It's, it's happened once for certain, in my experience. There was a man who came on here to die and succeeded with terminal cancer. But I'm sure a lot of people come on saying, well, if I'm going to go, I'd like to go in style, as you say. Uh, and uh, this couple I'm telling you about, they actually said to me last night, well, we're living from port to port. Mostly, they're very old people on a world cruise. I think their relatives save up to send them on because the hospital bills are cheaper <laughs> than what they're paying in the States. Mm. They tell you that. Mm. It's cheaper to be on here for them. Oh. So you'd sort of coddle them, you know, for three months. I mean, there was one story of one, who, one passenger who never left a cabin, I heard. Yeah, that's my passenger. It was one of yours? Yeah. What was, what was she up to? Two lovely people, they were. Yeah. One was the passenger, the other was the companion. So the passenger never went out at all for 80 days. She has breakfast, lunch, dinner in every day. Went ashore in Southampton, was put into a hotel, and still had a dinner in her room in the hotel. Just satisfied to be on the ship. But they're getting wasted on, you see, so you don't need anything else. Nearing the tropics now, and the QE2 arrives in brilliant sunshine at Brisbane's brand new port. It's our first visit to Queensland, and the welcome's reflected by homesick palms. Then passengers go ashore to meet some original Australians at their most enchanting and demure. At the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, they're also delighted by other natives. Also enjoying the koalas, the QE2's most shy passenger, a Mexican multi-millionaire who's number three in the list of the world's tanker owners, Sergio Balonas. He's cruising in style in a string of penthouses with his wife and a bevy of nurses and aides, but has also brought with him the anxieties of today's Mexico, armed guards. Fearful lest his children are kidnapped, he employs security men whenever the family ventures ashore, though only feels really safe when back on board. So this amiable family, shadowed by hefty trigger men, casually overdressed and alert for goodness knows what, within the gentle atmosphere of a sanctuary. It's an albino. You don't get it's, it's the only one known in the world at the moment, so it's very, very good. Cruisers pose for the sanctuary's cameramen. Equally obliging, the 83 available koalas also tolerate considerable indignity without a cross gesture, and when not on camera, tend to doze, despite the company. Oh, thank you. Their claws, however, are designed for climbing trees, not dresses. For a vice-like grip, they have two thumbs on each front paw. 
keepers are heavily scarred. All right. Stand up straight in the sun. You have to keep your hands very still. And up straight. That's it. <laughs> Bring out the 46 D cup koala, please. What is it? Slide. Okay. <laughs> with teeth clenched and many an anxious grimace, cruisers escape with their pictures scratch free. The 350 tons of food the QE2 is now carrying includes ridiculous shipping orders like 90,000 jars of jam. 3,000 tins of pâté de foie gras, three tons of smoked salmon, and sufficient sausages, I'm assured, to girdle a globe, which might not be a pretty sight. We have a store of roughly about uh, three quarters of a million value of stock. Three quarters of a million pounds worth of, of food? I'll prove it, yes. And how long could, could the ship sail without being stocked up again? Um, I would say something about two to three weeks. No more than three weeks. With all this, I would have thought you could have gone for months. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be amazing how much our passengers request it. We're eating a lot. You're eating yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my oh. Oh. I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is all one enormous fridge. So. Yes, this is where we keep all our loin porks, roast beef, and different kinds of meats. And um, we have another, about another six fridges like this. And we have an old pig, which <laughs> suckling there, which we use on the luncheon buffets. It's quite a favourite of our passengers, actually. Another favourite must be their store of 45,000 bottles of wine and 13,000 bottles of whisky, 41 different brands, for the four passenger restaurants and seven bars. To preserve the balance in these 30 walk-in fridges, the ship also carries 25,000 gallons of milk. But within this safe, there's another safe guarding the priceless pearls of the Caspian. We take a third of the world's caviar. And at the present moment, we have somewhere in the region about um, uh, 160,000 pounds worth. Oh, goodness me, then it is worth uh, it's quite picking a, up yes. money with. How did the kind of mail show you? It comes in these. Uh... Come in, we, these are comes in here. Uh, and then we have the. This is the. Uh, that's beluga. the beluga, that's the best. This is the finest, yes. Yes, yes. And, and then we have. Oh, this the, is all beluga up here. This is all beluga here. Yeah. And then on this one over here, we have the ceruga. That's the cheap stuff. <laughs> the Savoga, <laughs> yes. We use about 20 pounds a day God. in weight. That's and, um, <laughs> That's a... and, and that is about, about a thousand pounds worth a day. A roughly. thousand pounds money? A thousand pounds money, surely. Yes, yes. That's a lot of caviar. Oh. So some people are eating their way through their tickets, really. And some people say they never see it, they never eat it. So all I can assume is that some people I mean, eat plenty. Well, don't look at me. <laughs> Although I have to confess, it's my greatest weakness. But who can afford it anywhere else? That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, my steward has told me that some passengers have asked for caviar sandwiches. Oh and, yeah. And caviar omelets and, ca yeah. and caviar souffle. Well, it's you know, mad. the way it's gone today is you're right when you say it's mad because I really think myself that caviar should only be served one way. Of course. It's... On its own, chilled, with a glass of vodka. Champagnes and wines are stored quite casually, but then they won't be here long, and the motion of the ship precludes the carrying of older wines. Vintage port is unknown, so sensibly they offer the best of the younger vintages. And now your premium, here's a, uh, a Tattinger. It's blank de blank. Yes, how much is that? That's, um, oh dear, what the hell's the price of that now? I think it's 48, uh, it's, it's $45. Too it's too expensive Sorry, for me, anyway. Sorry, I've forgotten the price of that one. Here's a... No, you wrote her a crystal. A crystal. Yes, that's fifty-five dollars a bottle. Seventy-six. Finishing up with uh, Dom Perignon. Dom Perignon at fifty-eight dollars a bottle. A vintage seventy-five. Right. Now are you selling that? Yes, we're doing it very, very well on that. We've sold well over two hundred and fifty bottles so far. Not the engine room, the beer store. It's mainly for the crew who have four bars and a quite phenomenal daily consumption.
down on deck seven and eight in the bow of the ship, right up at the pointed end below the waterline. It's always 46 degrees, even today when we're sailing tropical seas. So in absolutely splendid condition, the beer's piped straight through to the pig and whistle, where it's well received at 31 pence a pint. One of the four crew bars, the castaways, is gay. This one, the pig, is not. Young fellas uh, do sometimes uh, have a few too many drinks, um, and uh, you are, and some of them have problems at home which they don't tell anyone around, yeah. and they keep it to themselves and it may come out when they've had a few drinks. So uh, we have a lot of young men in the kitchens. We have 137 men here working, and uh, we have a lot of older, experienced men who've been with us on the old queen, yeah. and they blend in very well with the young ones. So if sometimes we run against a, a, a problem with, a, with our crew, it's, it's, uh, it's not such a big thing, really. At the time, it seems big, yeah. but next day, it's. It's, it's cooled on down. again. It cools down. I yeah. mean, every now and then the lid blows off the pot. Well, but... kitchens have always been um, fairly flashpoint areas yeah. uh, when the height of the service is on. Right, gentlemen, just one or two small points for you. This soft, fresh fruit that's coming on board, it is for the passengers' use. It comes in the fruit bowls. It stays in the fruit bowls for the passengers. If you require it, you can get it from the kitchen. You've only got to see the fruit man for it. And the same with the desserts. The vanilla slices lunchtime run out. Because <laughs> you fellas had all noshed them beforehand. Now, Mr. Norton has some disturbing news for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen. I can remember when this restaurant was made up of men. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's sadly for one of us, here tonight, it's all over. <laughs> and the person that's been caught finally yeah. is Carl Hutchinson. <laughs> Sincerest good wishes for tomorrow and his wedding day. Carl. Yeah, yeah. Like any other closed community, the QE2 lives through light and shade, the happy events and the fights in those flashpoint kitchens. But through it all, she moves serenely across the water like a swan, gracious and effortless. That, of course, is above the surface. Below and out of public sight, there's some furious pat. so that passengers may live in elegant calm, the crew must strive endlessly in their various ways. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ruth. Happy birthday to you. The service uh, can vary. I think if, you, if you're lucky to have two good waiters, you've got splendid service. And I think it could be very, very good all over. It's just that you're dealing with British staff, don't forget. Well, that means they have a strong union. The, the, I think things have changed. Now, i am as you know, been in the hotel trade so many years, and I think for the last 10 years, things have changed. You do not get, you have, these workers are now got their, times and they have to have their certain double pay for Saturdays or Sundays, holidays and all this has altered the friendly and the bond between hoteliers and their workers, I think. And so the same with the ship and the, oh, and the crew? Yes, of course. This is a hotel, isn't it? Yes. It's a five-star hotel, just not the food is five-star. And if they start 
doing this, which you've had, you get on the show. I mean, I've had them where they start doing this. Uh, yeah. Or they start going, Stuart, Stuart, and they start whistling to you. Uh -huh. Or not even that, it's just their attitude. Uh. Some passengers you get can't wait. Now, this ship, as you know, is run by the English standards. You know, we think now the main people are Americans who like quick, fast service. Yes. And they'll be in and out. And now, an American sometimes will come in and he won't sit down, he'll pick up the menu and he'll give you your order straight away. And he'll say, Stuart, I want, I want now. You know, and you sort of think, and if you, you get him out as quick as you can, and that's 35 minutes, I gave a passenger, it took a passenger, me to give a passenger uh, a starter, a main course, and a sweet, and coffee, 35 minutes. Now that's fast. Yeah. And they, sometimes they still say it's slow. Now we've been here 35 minutes, Stuart, and we can't tolerate it anymore. Once every week, the QE2 receives a going over few stationary five star hotels could sustain. The hotel manager's staff give the Columbia restaurant its regular ferocious inspection. For the day of today, the order of food will be at 12.30. Which one? The pages. And the coming way, is that it? No, I don't. No, I don't. Oh, there. Some absent stewards earn praise. He's very good, this Pope, isn't he? Pope, isn't he? Just Pope. Pope. He's a very tall boy. Yeah. And some don't get praised. They've left a layer of sugar. All the way down the side. That's a fault. We'll have to rectify it. We got that on the other one, too. What section is this? Yeah. Two, two, nine, eight, three. Two, nine, three. Two, nine, three. Two, nine, three. Two, nine, three. Talbot? No. It's going to be very popular, young man. Jo I, I, John, I think we should get hold of Talbot and, and then... Do we uh, tell our father? I like it, I like it. And yes, reprimand him. Yes. We should reprimand this man. It's not, not been sanitised. Yes, I do. I agree. It's part yeah. of satisfactory. And make sure it's recorded down yes. the writer's office as well. Yeah. I give him discipline action on it. Before an anxious restaurant manager, one of the stewards is shown the error of his ways. Some passengers may love their stewards, but officers can find them resistible. It's gone through the machine, Mr. Phillips, and you make sure told not to wipe up for it. Make it irrespective of that. It's your still your responsibility to check this is clean. Yeah, well, so That's not gone, clean. It's That's it's not clean. It's gone through the machine. We were told well, not to going wipe up for it. It's not clean. Can't you see it? I'll lend you a pair of glasses. Not even a tray was clean. Turbulence in the dining room, but tranquility on deck. Gliding through the warm coral sea, passengers and crew come out into tropical sunshine to experience the Great Barrier Reef. Today, it's all smooth sailing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Stanley speaking. A severe tropical cyclone, Eleanor, has been drifting slowly west-southwest at four knots for the last 48 hours, with winds up to 125 miles per hour near the center. Had it maintained its track, we should have passed some 200 miles ahead of Eleanor about midnight tonight. At 2 a.m. this morning, Brisbane Tropical Warning Centre advised that Eleanor had speeded up to eight knots, which meant that we would have been within 100 miles at midnight. An increase in speed of approach would have put QE2 in the centre of the cyclone at midnight. A decision was therefore reluctantly taken at 0300 this morning that we must cancel the call at Whitsunday Island and increase speed to get out of the danger area as quickly as possible. So American Express, gritting its teeth, hands back $40,000 received for shore excursions along the reef. Our view of Whitsunday Island has been blown away. Even a well-stabilised liner of 67,000 tonnes is wary of Eleanor, who moves at 125 knots and shows no respect for size. Caught in these waters without room to manoeuvre, in just such a cyclone back in 1911, the good ship Young Gala went down with all hands. So today the QE2 turns and runs before the storm. 
In Eleanor's path, the sea's still smooth, but there's a distinct swell. So some passengers' thoughts turn to turbulence. We were on one cruise that was so terrible in the Caribbean. We were the only ship that made all the ports that week. It was the luck of the draw of the ports. 60% of our ship was in bed the entire week, and the plate racks would fall, and the plates would go all over the dining room. And our family would go into the dining room saying, isn't this fun? And we were taking waves over the bow that would wash the whole ship. And you'd be in entertainment at night, and you'd look, and a wave would just cover the ship. And everybody would say, look, including us. We loved it, just loved it. You couldn't walk without holding them. And I was in my element, so was our whole family. We had our children on board. You must have been the least popular uh, that's family why I on said board. You they hate hated to go you. into the dining room and say, I'm just starving when people are running out holding napkins to their mouths. Aww. It was terrible. We love it. Having outmaneuvered the cyclone, the QE2 produces her own drama, which nobody loves. One of her miles of pipes has corroded and burst, and seawater's pouring into the immaculate, freshly inspected Columbia restaurant. Passengers don't know about this little local emergency, or doubtless they'd be standing by the lifeboats. So, an amusing little seawater 84 goes into the champagne buckets at room temperature. An awful lot of people appeared on the scene very quickly, as you saw, and they all know what specific task they have to do and, and cope with it quite well. And what, what's the system? What are you going to do now? Well, what we're doing at the present moment, we're stripping the tables off completely, removing the tables, roll the carpet back and remove the underlay, and then we'll have to put the carpet back down to dry it out before we relay new carpet. But well, this is salt water, so you, yes. you, you, everything there's got to be slung. Yes, we will have to renew the carpet here. Once some water gets into it, it's, uh, it's no good. How are you coping with the cabins below? Well, unfortunately, the, the water that seeped through the, um, through the deck onto, onto the one deck below, uh, we managed to stop the water going into the cabins and we contained it in the alleyway, which means we'll do the same operation down there as we've done up here and replace the alleyway carpet. So how much spare carpet do you carry in your stores? Quite a lot, quite a lot. <laughs> And of course, it has to be salt water, doesn't it? Yeah. It wouldn't be fresh water. That's right. That's right. Fresh what... water, it's not too bad. You can cope. You, you don't need to replace carpet. Yeah. What about the guests now? How are you going to cope? The passengers? Um, we have sufficient room um, to, to move them for tonight to a different table. And then by tomorrow morning, they'll be all ready to go back to the table, so it'll be all brand new again. Back to the same place? Right, absolutely. <laughs> So enough deep pile carpet to cover a tennis court goes over the side to cover the floor of the Pacific. Watch your backs! Come out of it! Okay, she goes. Okay, she goes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. After all the tiny dramas of the day, cruisers return with relief to the trough. But before the usual splendid dinner, those magic tins must be reverently removed from a locked refrigerator within a double-locked larder. We're about to observe that significant daily ceremony, the trooping of the caviar. crew don't get caviar on their mess decks, but they get just about everything else in help yourself quantities. Their food's abundant without being highly decorated. 
Well, tonight we have this, this particular thing I'm making now, which is a French sweet called Il Flottante, which is a floating island. You know, of course, my I, I am the most loved and hated man on the ship. Because you do, you've, you've yeah, got the weight they up, love me you? for the cakes, you see, yeah. but they hate me because of the, when I, they buy all these fabulous dresses and all that kind of thing, you know, and yeah. of course they can't get them on after a fortnight, and they say, yeah. my God, you know. It's your and, fault. Yeah, it's my fault, you know. Yeah. And it's but we love you really. This, this is really. what you're doing now, this yes. very minute. Yes. But it, it must it, be about a pound a squeeze. Oh, God, yes. She has to lose some weight. This year she came away, the first words, wasn't it? Here's my diet book. Whatever you do, keep me on it. Don't let me get off of it. So she's done this, and very well. I think she's lost 15 pounds up mm. to now. She's done very well. It's a hell of a place to come to diet, that's all I can say. <laughs> oh, there, yes. there, anyways. You get a lot of people go on crash diets. I mean, yeah. this is um, Bornstein, you know, yeah. and they will stick to it religiously. Oh, yeah. Well, the only crash diet here is not to come in this room, isn't it? That's the first thing. Stay out of it. Well, we usually say when they say, oh, I'm going to lose some weight, we guarantee a pound a day. You know? Yeah. Wait, yeah. Yeah. But that, that's been, you know. And they. A pound of weight. A pound of weight per day. Put on. Yeah, oh, yes. Club Suzettes, we have a few orders. Not quite a lot to that because they're, they're the head waiters, by the way, are my friends, but they're running out of ideas at the moment, so they're relying on me, you see. But we have Spotted Dick, Spotted Dick, English Plum Pudding, Cream Brulee, Floating Ireland, Chocolate Mousse, Raspberries of Aglioni, if you want. Uh, cheese Souffles, which I've crossed off, which I'm going, you know, as, as I do them, I cross them off. Apple turnovers and custard, and then the souffles, Rothschild, Grand Marnia, chocolate, lemon with orange sauce, and of course the Rothschild, which is on the menu tonight. The antidote is to hang in there till we get off and go home and, and hit the exercises again. On board, I just give up because I'm enjoying myself. Hey, what all this I did have a diet lunch today. Did you? I brought it all the way from the United States. It's only four courses. No, no, it's a powder <laughs> I mixed up in my room. I truly did. Oh. Oh. It is. And what did your husband have? He went to lunch. This is some glazed grapes that somebody wants to say grapes all put into a hot, very hot sugar. It's very, very hot. This kind of thing doesn't happen very much in the world now, does it? Because you've, Not got, at all. you've got the best of everything. And it's a sort of expense, no object operation. That's correct. Like me spending this time at the moment. You know, on one single person. Yes. You know, short side, I would be contending with, say, maybe 50 or 60 special orders. Yeah. Which to pay the way. Yes, of you course. You understand? I mean, that, that thing you just made uh, would cost how much in a well, restaurant? Well, that, that, I would say about 15 to 20 pounds. At just least. that one little dish. Just that one little dish. Mm. As you saw, I, the, the liqueur that we put into it is bottles. Yes. Yes. Bottles. You know, I have a bottle of sherry, a bottle of Grand Marnie, a bottle of brandy. And it's just pouring in ad lib. Can you do all this delicate stuff when the ship is? Uh... Well, I, well, I, well, I, I really. Well, the hardest thing I do is birthdays, writing happy birthday on a cake when the ship's going. Like, yes. Yeah. You know, yeah, I forget I'm to going, the I'm, go, I'm going like this when the cake's going, and I'm trying to write happy birthday, and happy anniversary on the cake. Working three months on, one month off, for around £6,400 a year, all found, stewards have a sought-after job these days and no longer need rely upon tips, which at any level below decks is the one unmentionable subject. Well, there's no such thing as a favourite passenger. Um, the big tippers have got to be favourite to start with. No, no, strange but the same, no. Everybody's treated the same way. Now, for argument's sake, on a cruise like this, you have some people will give you something regularly. Some will go all the way through the cruise. You never know. I mean, this is a touchy subject, but you never know whether you're going to get something at the end. But yeah. it doesn't make any difference. You treat them all the same. You don't know till the end of the trip what sort of tippers they're going to be. As long as people are nice. It doesn't all revolve around. It doesn't around. Yes. You know, it if they it come and say bye-bye, miss, thank you very much for looking after us. Bye-bye. See you again. It revolves around it's the people ones that scoot to... away. I mean, you don't know till the end of the trip what sort of tippers they're going to be. And you're not doing a job, really, no. for tips. No. You're doing it because you're getting paid to do it. You know, you don't want people giving you a hard time, really. So if they're nice passengers, you're nice with them. The money doesn't matter that much. People think you're a bit too mercenary. You know, you get that old stint that goes around as, you know, you're there for but what they you travel with, do they I'm not saying some involved? people are not. That's in every walks of life. But basically, they keep you employed. You're there to do a service. 
and any extra that you get, obviously, it goes down well. And the tax man's quite pleased. He, yeah. <laughs> he's he's there waiting for his little bit. Even do the service. We get hit badly with the British tax, very badly. I think you know, it's not just us, it's all. all I would say no more on that, Mark. No, no. Backstage and unseen by the passengers, the captain must run a tight ship. The seamen who keep this hotel moving are subject to the special disciplines of the Merchant Navy, which can be a bit like the Royal Navy with shop stewards. Though 15 years old, conditions aboard the QE2 are good, and 80% of the crew cabins are singles or doubles. Each week, they're inspected. Two horrible long names. <laughs> yeah. It keeps it nice and clean anyway, doesn't it? Mm. Those look a bit tatty, Charlie. That, that live jacket you seems to have a... Ah, Charlie. Right. Look at his wardrobes. See yeah. He's keeping those tidy. Not bad. Every young person dreams of travelling around the world. Yeah. And, and if they get a chance of a job, like on a ship or with the airlines or anything, to them, that's fantastic. But maybe to the older people that have done it for years, and they've done it for a few years, you know, um, it's maybe more financial reasons. But with the younger people, I'd say a lot, the majority of younger people, it's definitely travelling. Nowadays, the way people travel, one place is exactly the same that's as another. Right, yeah. A city is a city. There are the added attractions which you look at, but the language is about the only different thing now you see. There's people want to sell you things, you want to buy things, and that's about basically what it is. That's what happens everywhere. Yeah, yeah this right. is it, you know, and you get very disillusioned with it. You read all the brochures, but when you actually see it for yourself, well, we're lucky because we get paid for it. But people that pay a lot of money, I don't know how they feel afterwards, I'm sure. But most of those people, having solved the main problem of the day, which is what to wear for dinner, do seem quite satisfied. And so do some of the more decorative ship's officers. It is a, a man's world, and we're the, well, we're the only three, well, four of us, actually, four female officers amongst, I don't know, 50 officers? Least 50 male officers, so when you go in the wardroom, it's, can you sit at my table? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a good choice, Not haven't we? Bad. Four yeah. to 50. Mm. But I'm told you've closed in on one of the, an unsuspecting young officer. Well, somebody closed in on me, actually. <laughs> And you're, yes. getting, you're leaving to marry? That's right. Mm -hmm. is he, he's an officer? He's a deputy chief engineer on the Cunard Countess. Ah, so it is something like a marriage bureau, this... Uh... Well, I think in the two years that I've been here, um, I think seven nurses have left, and nearly all of them, apart from one, have got married to officers from the ships. So I think it is a bit of a marriage bureau, really. So if you play your cards right... <laughs> Who knows? You're, you're scouting around? I'm chatting to the punters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to have more social life for the crew. Not <laughs> you. Definitely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Women don't have much. Definitely. There's nothing for women. No, there's nothing. It's um, just either you go uh, to the pick and whistle every night and get drunk. Mm. So we you don't stay in, you read a book. Mm. You know, there's just nothing. But on the smaller ships, you're more organised because you're together more. You're like a family. I mean, you and I, if you were waiting on the ship, could walk up the gangway together and we wouldn't see each other for three months. Yes. You know, yeah. it's that big. There was a joiner <coughs> who came on board and he was in his civvies, in a suit. And I said, oh, hello, so-and-so. You know, and he said, hello, mate. I said, have a nice leave. Mate, he says, I've been left this ship six years. <laughs> <laughs> Also making their own entertainment, the restaurant stewards. Dealing at the same time a nasty blow to the belief that all stewards are limp-wristed.
All ships even do it all. No one on board knowing what to do. On board, there's upstairs and downstairs, but this is the mezzanine. The wardroom's winter cruise show, a romp full of in-jokes appreciated by officers and their guests. The captain, some wives, a few favoured passengers. At, at a British Leyland factory near Birmingham yesterday, there was an industrial accident in which a body worker lost two fingers. He didn't actually note it for loss until he had said goodnight to the foreman. <laughs> Now, would you do this job ashore? No. 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 Ah. no. Now, what does that well, say? Well, we did this job ashore mm. 70 hours a week. Mm. You'd have double wages. Mm. You'd have two jobs. Yes. Mm. There's no way I'd wait 70 then? hours. Well, well, if you wouldn't do it ashore, does it mean you, it's the travel you like? The, yeah. The world travels? Does it travel. mean it's the, it's the company you mm. have? Does it mean it's the way of life? Mm. Well, it's those three things. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So you'd miss it now if you went ashore, would you? So you I moan, you so. moan about it all the time, but you wouldn't like to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I think time after tells, 20 years, we've if got you're the past will moaning to go now. Home you know. and sit with your feet up and watch the telly. But then after a month, you're ready to come back on a ship again. You're bored, I think you yeah. miss friends. It's like a town, mm. the ship. It's like a big family. Mm. Actually, I've seen uh, myself, I've seen stewardesses and stewards retire, and they've really been broken-hearted. Mm. You know, we've got no one, we've got no family, no sisters nothing or home, brothers, no. nothing. Yeah. And this has been their life, as you said before, about 30 odd years. But that's married to the ship? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, mm. yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. So it's a way of life, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we Different have got a family else, if yeah. we want to go. We, we've got somebody to go home to. But you've got an awful lot of people that see that happen. You know. So we're a little breed on our own, aren't we? Wicker's World, a fast boat to China, is one of the programmes reviewed in Did You See on Sunday at 8.45 on BBC Two. And next Wednesday night in Wicker's Floating World, we'll see what happens when QE2 passengers and crew experience a run ashore in faraway places and various directions. Some dance with elephants, some with the mud men of Papua New Guinea. There's a day out in Bali, a night out in Pattaya, and some of them, I can tell you, will never be quite the same again. Thursday 